Thanks so much, Lynn. Uh, thanks so much, Stephen. Old Dharma friends, it's really nice to see you and uh, to connect with everyone out there in, um, I guess, <laughs> sheltering in space. Oh, the video stopped. Seems like the host has stopped it. Okay. Looks like I'm back. Um, video drop for a second. Let me know if there's, if we're good, Stephen. Um, yeah, so it's just wonderful to be here with you all in sheltering in space, as Lynn said, <laughs> on uh, Facebook Live and wherever you're joining in from Zoom. So um, as Lynn pointed out, we're going to talk about Beyond Mindfulness uh, today. It's a little bit of an awkward title because uh, uh, for those of you who are sort of longer term Buddhists, what's really beyond mindfulness, right, from a Buddhist perspective? Uh, for, when we're talking about Buddhist mindfulness, nothing's really beyond that, actually. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, as far as the, the path goes. Uh, but when we're talking about uh, mindfulness in the popular sense, then yes, like, where are we going? What are the steps we're taking in our practice, in our life, uh, to both sort of honor where we're at and doing the steps that are that are needed and necessary for our mental health uh, and well-being. And then also, like, uh, where can we play with that edge um, to explore the potential that we have as a human being? And this is really where the Buddhist path comes in as a, um, you know, some will argue the Buddhist path is a spiritual path. Some will argue it's a religion. I don't really get into those arguments so much anymore. I used to. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, whatever you want to call it is fine from my perspective, but it definitely does have some components that that make up what we would call um, uh, Buddhism. Now, Buddhism not being a monolithic tradition, uh, it being, I sometimes use Buddhism as a plural, like the Buddhisms, uh, because uh, we have many different branches of, of what uh, um, sort of interpretations and ways of practice of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to be pulling from Himalayan Buddhism here and the Tibetan Buddhist lineages and sort of some of those viewpoints uh, on what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about mindfulness, what we're talking about when we're pushing that edge of our human potential and what we can actually come into contact with and uncover as a human being in this body. So to me, that's the uh, most interesting thing to explore right now. And so I'd like to talk about that with you. Um, before we do that, I think we'll do a little bit of practice together. Um, so we'll probably practice for about 15 to 20 minutes together. I'll guide it and leave some uh, portion silent. And then um, I'll give a short talk on, on the topic today, and then we can do some Q&A um, at the end here. So if you haven't already, go ahead and find a relaxed yet alert posture. If you haven't found a quiet space, maybe it's a good time to do that. Place where you don't need to be bothered. Put your phone notifications on silent. And just taking a moment to come into the body. So as you start to find your meditation posture, which is something that we want to feel alert in, like awake in the body, but also relaxed. A way to think of meditation in the context I'm going to be presenting it is relaxed awareness. But relaxation has a certain connotation here. It doesn't mean sort of checking out relaxation. It means finding ease in the body and mind with awareness, with this quality of mind. So just go ahead and do what feels good for you coming into the body as we start out. If that means moving a little bit, stretching, twisting. doing something that feels good and as we kind of maybe roll our shoulders a bit allowing some settling to happen in the body the same with our posture here if you know traditional seven point meditation posture you can go ahead and form that if you don't more or less just having a straight spine and we work with the gaze as well so if you want to allow your eyes to be half open or fully open I generally um, uh, don't encourage too much uh, closing the eyes completely, though if that's the way you've been practicing, that's fine. 
And just simply allowing a sense of connection to our experience right now, if you can do that. And so for some of us, that's challenging. So having some kind of anchor is helpful. So the anchor here is just going to be the sensation of our feet, legs, seat below us. Just the sensation of that against our skin, the weight of the body on the, on the chair or connected to the cushion or floor. And as you start to attune to that, attuning to the body as a whole, what this means is starting to pay attention to what energies, emotions, sensations are up for you. And for some of us, we don't feel the body often. So don't worry if it's, this is slightly disconnected or challenging for you. But just give it a shot. This could be attuning to one part of the foot, toe, leg, seat. Just dropping everything into that. And being. Being here means being with the experience, with what's arising. And if you need the breath as an anchor, if that's something that you use in your daily practice, allowing connection to the inhal inhalation and exhalation through the nose, that's fine, but use the breath now to connect with the feeling in the body. So the breath draws you into the seat, the legs, the feet. On the inhalation, on the exhalation, allows you to be with the experience. And also now we can start to include our belly, our chest, our head, where a lot of our emotional content arises, in our mid-body, in our chest, in our belly. And so the practice here is not to push away our experience, but to allow it to be. And this includes whether we're having a comfortable experience right now or an uncomfortable experience or just something neutral. And let's play with this experience where if we don't fixate to it, but we also don't push it away or reject it, there's space to be aware to allow and there's compassion towards ourself towards our feeling so let this happen experientially don't think too much about it just listen to the words and orient your awareness towards your experience and so there's awareness and there's relaxation in the sense of we're just allowing things to be what they are we're not changing fixing manipulating Indulging. Just allow sensations to arise and pass. And if they want to arise and stay, that's also fine. And of course, if they become too overwhelming, there's no need to sort of stagnate with something that's overwhelming and uncomfortable. You can just go to the breath if you'd like. But I want to encourage you here to work with what's uncomfortable in a new way if there's something uncomfortable arising. Again, just because I can't see you out there in Facebook land, I'm not sure who's listening to this. Be kind to yourself. So if something's so overwhelming, like I would say a six, seven, or eight, nine out of a 10, just go to the breath. Don't worry about meeting that. Or go somewhere else in the body that feels more neutral. And if there's something that's uncomfortable but workable, practice being with that. Not indulging, not pushing away or trying to block. And what is being with us? Awareness. Awareness knows. Awareness is bearing witness to what's arising. But awareness isn't in there trying to figure it out. That's not awareness. That's the thinking mind, the discursive mind. So drop the discursive mind into the body. Allow energies, sensations, moods, emotions to flow. And they simply just arise within the mirror of mind. And that's the awareness. 
that part of the mind that knows what's arising in the mirror of mind. And so we'll practice like that for another 10 or 15 minutes, bringing the attention back to this process of bearing witness. If you need the object of the breath to help connect you to that, great. If you don't, just be with the experience, the felt experience. This particular practice isn't really about having a calm meditation or a focused meditation. It's about being present with awareness to what's arising within the body, feeling the feeling. Again, I recognize this is not easy, but just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. And just because it's not easy doesn't mean we can't practice doing this. So... It's probably going to orient a little bit. Then you're going to get distracted into the analytical thinking sort of discursive mind. Then you come back to being. Just drop into the body being again and again with a sense of not really trying to get anywhere, but just engaging the practice. One of the biggest obstacles I've experienced in meditation is trying to get somewhere. And usually where I'm trying to get is just the thought of where I'm trying to get. It's not the actual experience. Sometimes the thought blocks us from actually experiencing our nature of mind, compassion, loving kindness, bodhicitta. So let's engage the practice. Don't worry so much what it looks like. Don't worry sort of am I doing a right or wrong. Just do it. If you continually engage the practice, you'll see fruit. And you'll know what it is. You don't have to form some fantasy, some idea of what it might be. You don't have to think, is that it? Is that not it? Just do it.
I'm just noticing what's shifting for us when we allow, when we don't deny, but we also don't indulge. For some of us, this can take time, but for some of us right away, we can feel the nervous system settle, the body settle. So there's just a place to be. We're not rejecting what's arising, but we're also not indulging or fully accepting it. And so for some of us with a little more meditation experience, we might be able to see how things are arising within the mirror of mind. It's now becoming that mirror, but still allowing feeling to move, perceptions to move. Just become the mirror that bears witness to experience. Still, we're not blocking, we're not indulging. We're also not holding on to stillness. But if the mind is naturally still, that's fine. But we're not holding on to stillness and pushing away what's moving within the mind. Just allowing movement but knowing the movement. And mind simply reflects what's arising. So here, everything is allowed to arise. We're not blocking. We're noticing when we're getting mixed up in, and just refresh the meditation. You notice your attention getting mixed up in the thought, emotion, feeling. But we're not blocking, we're allowing. And refreshing just means becoming aware. So what defines meditation from a Buddhist perspective? Awareness. We're just simply clicking back into awareness, this mind that can know itself, this mind that can bear witness, this quality of mind that knows we're knowing, sense of presence, And so compassion, warmth, care, love can also arise. What's innate to our potential also can arise. And so letting go of the formal meditation. 
notice what happens when you sort of relax a little bit more. For some of us, you might actually connect with this meditation when you let go of what you think is formal. But just staying with awareness. So we don't sort of make such a big gap between meditation and post-meditation. We just stay aware. Maybe in the post-meditation, we train the mind in loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta, this quality of how we're relating to phenomena. So if you'd like merging awareness with movement, again, moving the body in a way that feels good to you, gently stretching if you'd like. Hey, thank you so much. So um, typically when I give Dharma talks these days, I like to uh, take refuge and generate bodhicitta via sort of chanting it formally and do some other lineage supplications. So uh, you can join me if you have a Buddhist practice. If you don't, uh, the idea here is we're just connecting with our innate potential for awakening. And we're generating that as an interconnected uh, sense of, of compassion, love, and purpose. And we call this the Bodhi mind that seeks purpose and awakening for the benefit of others. So if you'd like to engage in sort of touching in with your own sense of that, well, I chant, that's great. If you know the chants, you can also join me. And then still the idea is the chant is to prompt that, right? Not just the chant. Sangin cho don so gin cho nam na jan cho bardo tani kyam so chi bagi jin so gi pe so nam ki jo la penchir sangi jo parsho. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Sangha, I take refuge until enlightenment. By the merit of practicing the paramitas, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Oh,明朝金也不懂呢。都什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音哦,你让什么上个空音
at least the way we think about it in, in the Himalayan traditions, the Himalayan Buddhist traditions, is that there's really nothing beyond mindfulness in the sense that uh, mindfulness is something that we need to engage every single practice with, whether we're practicing compassion uh, in meditation or in action, we're practicing loving kindness in meditation or action, uh, bodhicitta, uh, lojong, tonglen, all of these practices, uh, practices on the on uh, sort of the nature of reality, shunyata, whatever we're doing, we need some kind of mindfulness or engagement of awareness uh, being present with what we're doing, right? So, so whether someone's doing ritual practices, chanting, um, or just simply sitting with the breath, all of these engage this capacity of the mind to be aware. Now, typically translators have translated the word mindfulness in the, in the Buddhist paradigm as an aspect of awareness, uh, usually in Tibetan we call it jempa, which means to remember the object of meditation or to remember awareness. So um, mindfulness typically is not the whole thing. It's just sort of a piece of the pie. It's sort of like, you know, mainly we're aware of the object of meditation. We're aware of the mind that's uh, present and, and, and practicing whatever we're engaging with. And then we need to be able to remember to come back when that mind gets distracted, right, by thoughts uh, or sidetracks in the meditation. And so that remembrance we typically we typically call mindfulness, so drempa. Though mindfulness now in the popular kind of terminology of it has become sort of a catch-all uh, representing awareness itself, right? And then the other components I'm talking about, maybe vigilance or, or remembrance, uh, all of that. So that's the way I'm going to use mindfulness just in that popular sense of, of representing awareness. So like I said, in, in, in traditional uh, uh, Buddhism, mindfulness is simply something we, we cultivate. It's something that is the, we could say is like the beginning of meditation, the middle of meditation and the end of meditation. In the beginning, it's, cultivating that presence, cultivating that quality of mind that can be present, aware, knowing uh, uh, what we're experiencing, but not just knowing, knowing, uh, knowing and being aware that we're knowing that. So, you know, the difference might be we can look at a flower and we know it's a flower, but awareness and meditation is, is knowing we're knowing that flower. So there's a quality of mind that's not only just present with that experience, but it's knowing that experience is happening, knowing that knowing is happening. It's a little bit awkward to say that, but those of you who have been meditating a little while, you'll, you'll pick up on what I'm saying. Those of you who are newer, uh, just don't worry about it. Just take in the words and we can, we can talk it out in the Q&A if, if need be. So in the beginning, that's just sort of what we need. We need some, some presence of mind that's here and now. Because what does the mind tend to do? The mind tends to jump everywhere and sort of uh, run after this and run after that. And, you know, this emotion comes and suddenly we're this emotion. You know, this thought comes and suddenly we're in a whole play of events, right? Uh, Future tripping and fantasizing or, you know, remembering uh, what happened yesterday and re-triggering that emotional experience, be it something, you know, positive or, or, or destructive for us. Um, so this is what the mind does. This is habitually, if we just leave the mind uh, to itself, this is what it does. So in the beginning, we have to train the mind. We have to train the mind to be here, be present. Uh, uh, we train in, you know, uh, meditative concentration or attention. In the middle, uh, that attention and uh, uh, presence is begins to stabilize. And so we begin to turn the mind towards itself. We begin to turn the mind towards the activity of insight or uh, looking towards how things are, how we uh, relate to our sense of identity in, in any given moment, how we're relating to others and other phenomena around us. And so there's a quality of investigation and inquiry here where mindfulness upgrades into what we call uh, insight or vipassana. And so it might, like I said, in the beginning, it might start with just stabilizing in the present moment, and then it might grow into this intermediate space of, of uh, uh, bearing witness to and inquiry into, not, not necessarily inquiry, inquiry with a thinking mind. So sometimes that's included in our, especially when we're doing sort of uh, 
uh, methodologies from philosophical Buddhism or especially in the Himalayan traditions, we're using Mariamaka, uh, which is, uh, translates as middle way teachings. And we're using those middle way methods to investigate or analyze. And that could be uh, conceptual, but also can be less conceptual in, in the sense of we're just inquiring into the nature of something. Like we might be looking at a flower inquiring into whether this flower um, has independent existence or uh, is it dependent on other things, that kind of thing. So in the intermediate, we also stay, we start to gain some stabilization of that. We start to use the mindfulness to penetrate into how things are, and we start to see more clearly into how things are. And why do we do this in Buddhism? Because we become more free through this activity. Uh, we are able to become more free in seeing clearly into the nature of our emotions, the, uh, the nature of our identities, uh, into the nature of interaction in the world, and we're able to act more skillfully. Uh, there starts to become more space for compassion, love to arise naturally. There's more space for purpose and meaning to arise, and more skillfulness in our interactions with others. Now, where mindfulness benefits in the end is sort of uh, uh, mindfulness becomes like, uh, <laughs> how to say, now this is something I'm just pulling out of my hat, so take it with a grain of salt. It sort of becomes uh, mindfulness beyond mindfulness, or maybe we can even say like uh, mindless mindfulness. <laughs> I just made that up, so don't, again, just take it with a grain of salt. I'll explain what I mean. Of course, we don't, we're not trying to be mindless, right? But this sense that when we, when we penetrate more into how things are, we're able to simply be in flow with how things are uh, on a relative level. And that unifies with how things are ultimately existing or function. And these two kind of come together uh, as a unity. This is really uh, the, what we're looking to do through the Buddhist path. And then from there, there's, there's sort of a quality of, of inner space and freedom that can interact with the world that doesn't deny what's arising in ourselves and others, but it's also not bound by it or, or fixed or, or changed by it simply can flow and interact in a more healthy, holistic way. And so in this way, there's this kind of sense of, of uh, there's no more holding on to mindfulness as this thing. The mindfulness has become perfected in the sense where we're simply just experiencing reality as it is. And therefore, there's not a need to sort of hold on to a strict object of mindfulness or mindfulness or awareness being with a strict object. The awareness itself sort of expanded uh, uh, beyond time, beyond space, beyond uh, being aware or not aware. So maybe that's more accurate with what I was saying. It's sort of like mindfulness beyond mindfulness in the sense that awareness goes beyond the need to be aware in a, in a conscious sense, right? So this is really, of course, you know, it's not where I'm at. It's most likely not where you're at, though I'm not sure. Uh, this is what we tend to call fruition in Buddhism. And then, of course, all of the enlightened qualities come out of that eventually uh, for a person as they can continue to traverse that path. And, and, this is, and this moves on into Buddhahood, which I'm not going to talk about so much today. But this has certain qualities and, you know, what, what, what was abandoned through that experience or realization and then the qualities that come out of that realization. So this is what we would call kind of the, the, the final, the, the end, you know, sometimes we refer to it as the, the tenth bumi or beyond the tenth bumi, or we refer to it as Buddhahood or awakening or uh, fruition. Right. So anyways, just giving some context. Yeah. So where are we? We're mostly in the first one right? <laughs> Most of us, my, myself included, right? We're, we're still working with this basic mindfulness of training the mind to be here, to, to sort of not, to, to not launch into every fantasy, to notice when fantasy is arising, recognize it, and also to train the mind to just sort of be stable. Now, this is where I think uh, I want to focus in, in the topic today a little bit more. So now, why, what we're doing that for how we're using that matters, right? And so this is more this subject of beyond mindfulness I wanted to talk about. Of course, we have the beyond mindfulness, which is the fruition I just mentioned. But more of the beyond mindfulness I want to talk about is sort of this uh, mindfulness that um, we can take as a stepping stone, meaning like we might have 
um, a lot of emotional problems or anxiety problems and stress. And we take up meditation to relieve that stress, to relieve that anxiety. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. This is sort of, um, I don't know if there's, some, for you know some of us, I don't know if there's another way. We just have to start where we are. I think uh, my first entrance uh, 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 about 20 years ago or so uh, was definitely through just, you know, I wanted to understand why I was suffering in the way I was suffering. I wanted some relief, right? And and usually, you know, if we say, well, the relief, the full relief is Buddhahood, that's not so relatable to us in the beginning. So for me, you know, even though it was interesting, this idea of awakening or Buddhahood, full awakening, this mindfulness beyond mindfulness or or sort of the fruition of mindfulness, uh, that was interesting. It wasn't really my main focus in the beginning. It was just, you know, how do I experience a happier life? How do I uh, relate to my stress and anxiety? And so, um, you know, I pursued that in the beginning. And luckily, you know, I did encounter some Buddhist teachings that offered sort of other potentials um, for what we can use our meditation for. And so um, that's what I want to focus on today. So this is a fine starting place. But at a certain point, you know, we reach uh, uh, a plateau where that mindfulness is maybe we're better able to manage our emotions or, or work with them. We're better able to manage our anxiety. Um, may, you know, hopefully we're becoming a kinder, gent gentler uh, person uh, because of our mindfulness practice. And yet we kind of have this sense, this kind of suspicion Mm, is this it? <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm laughing because many people come to me kind of at this point where they're like, is this it? And, you know, usually people come to me when they recognize, no, no, it's not it. And then they want to go deeper. And yet, of course, some of us have, you know, allergies towards religion or allergies towards like a, a, a you know, an, an idea of like a fixed, you know, spiritual path we're dedicating to. And so we want to kind of continually bounce around or, we kind of enjoy the fruit salad approach, which is like, I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. And if I put it all together, I have my, you know, psychedelic mindfulness, uh, shamanic uh, Taoist sandwich with a little bit of hatha yoga in there. We put it all together. We think it's going to be better necessarily. Now, again, you have your right to experiment with that. And I'm not sort of trying to downplay that. I think there's some usefulness in the beginning in, in shopping around a little bit and seeing you know, what's out there. Because if we don't do that in the beginning, then we might later down the road, we might doubt and think, you know, because we're definitely going to hit obstacles. And not definitely, but most likely we'll hit obstacles in our meditation practice. And the obstacle isn't really a problem. The problem is when, when we uh, uh, form a lot of doubt around that obstacle and then we abandon our path we've been on. So in the beginning, it's good to explore a little bit. And then you kind of exhaust things that maybe don't have as much meaning for you, then you say, oh, okay, this feels good. I'm going to stick with this for a little while. So that's really helpful. But fruit salad approach is a little bit different. It's like we continuously shop, but we never buy something. We just, you know, just imagine walking around a grocery store. You're hungry and you just shop and you look and it's like, hmm, you know, when I go to the grocery store now, I have to be very direct because there's like 10 different kinds of everything, right? 10 different kinds of ketchup, 10 different kinds of pickles, 10 different, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so I have to be very specific. Okay, I'm going for that one. And I don't think too much about it. But uh, for some of us, we get stuck there, you know, because there's so many options. And, and so we just stay and we endlessly look at the options. We endlessly d dabble and dibble and, you know, this feels good. I'm doing that. Oh, that stopped feeling good. I'm going to go do this. That feels good. Wonderful. This must be it. Then that stops feeling good. And then we move on. Does this sound familiar? Sorry. <laughs> it's maybe a little too direct. But this is kind of part of our human condition. So what we have to recognize in mindfulness practice when we're going beyond <clears throat> like a limited uh, sense of mindfulness, where, it, where, where again, to me, the limitation is not in that stepping stone where we just recognize we worked with our stress, we worth, worked with our emotions a bit, and then we're realizing we want to go deeper into understanding mind and, you know, what's going on here, right, in a deeper way. That's not a problem. But what can happen is what, what I've seen becomes a problem is when we're always looking to be reinforced by something. We're either trying to reinforce our belief or our, our identity around something, or we're, we're simply just seeking feel-good experience after feel-good experience. Another way to think of this is sort of like 
what happens in the modern world, this sort of workshop tripping, you know, going from one workshop to another, to another, to another, getting little nice experiences, and then that's it. It doesn't go deeper. In the Buddhist world, this can happen, especially in the Tibetan Buddhist world, I've noticed, and, you know, I've fallen victim to this uh, as well, is going from empowerment to empowerment to empowerment, to t- lama, to teacher, to teacher. We get little bliss from that teacher because, you know, they've done some work on their mind. And so we say, ah, okay, wow, this is an amazing person. And we get a little bit of a taste of our mind through them, but we mis- mistook it for them, right? Of course, they have some some you know, they practice and they're a good teacher and they're a good practitioner. There's definitely something to be gained from hanging out with them and studying with them. But we, we, we misplaced where it was coming from, right? We didn't see, ah, this is the potential of my mind and that needs to be fed, that needs to be nourished, right? And instead we, we kind of tripped on the llama or tripped on the teacher. And again, this happens to many of us. There's nothing, uh, you're not bad for this. It's just maybe something to recognize and then move on from, right? And, and then what does that mean? That means we have to then cultivate the practice. We have to study the Dharma, study the teachings, study where mindfulness can bring us in a deeper way and then apply it going deeper with the practice. So going back to the sense of, of feel-good experience versus what's going to be liberating, right? Because I think in a way... For some of us, this might be our only gauge, like our temperature gauge. It's like we, 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 we do get a hit for something. So first, I find when we're beginning to go beyond this limited self-help kind of mindfulness, uh, we need to be able to gauge the difference between what, what our craving wants, like what feels good and then we crave, versus what feels good because it's connecting us with our Buddha nature. So Buddha nature is a quality uh, that is not born. It doesn't die. Uh, it's not physical or material. It's not dependent on, on conditions and causes. And yet it arises. And, it, and from a Buddhist perspective, it's the basis of our uh, uh, beingness, maybe for lack of a better word, right? Even though there's no center of beingness or side of beingness. But the Buddha nature is sort of this quality that doesn't actually need to be perfected. It doesn't need to be changed or modified. It's just there. And the premise of the Buddhist path is, is a very positive one with this, because the idea here is that we're not necessarily do, you know, engaging the Buddhist path to become someone different or to become something different. We're merely uncovering and peeling away what's obstructing our Buddha nature. Some traditions would say you have to kind of, you know, we have this example of like uh, uh, churning milk for butter. So, you know, the path looks like we're churning the milk and we churn it enough through meditation, through developing compassion, through developing bodhicitta, through lojong, and then the butter of our Buddha nature starts to arise, right, as we do the processing. But in the end, that's just that processing is a little bit like an illusion. And so, because the idea here was that Buddha nature was, uh, is not really to be improved upon, it's we just need, we need to bring it out more or we need to uncover it. We also have the example of it being like a seed that needs to be watered and cared for and needs sun, and needs the right conditions and right soil and all of that. And that's, of course, you know, the environments we're in, the practices we do, what we connect with, what we uh, cultivate in our minds and hearts. But nonetheless, this Buddha nature is a very uh, positive thing when we reflect on it, because it means that we are innately OK, that innately um, we, we don't need to. Uh, modify who we are we just simply need to engage in things to understand what is obscuring this buddha nature and buddha nature is quite um uh, uh it's not something most of us can can kind of touch immediately we ha- we do have to do some training and, and and work to sort of be able to recognize that buddha nature and and to like i said either one way to think of it is cultivating the qualities to bring it out or you know, um, removing what's obscuring that Buddha nature. That's another way to think of it. But uh, I like to say this is sort of uh, the good news that we're not originally screwed up. And so if we're not originally screwed up, how can we take any method of meditation or mindfulness as a self-help technique? And how could any method of mindfulness or meditation simply uh, uh, be there uh, to, to sort of make us feel good? Right now, we could even say, like, feeling good or bad, this is really uh, 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 not the counterproductive, but it's like 
it's really uh, um, like antithetical, maybe is the word, antithetical to the essence of this Buddha nature. It's like the Buddha nature itself doesn't need to feel good or bad. It just is already okay. And so this kind of okayness is a little bit hard to explain. And it's not necessarily, uh, um, it's hard to explain because it's beyond words. It's beyond concept. But it's an okayness that actually goes beyond uh, okay or not okay. It's an okayness that goes beyond feeling good or feeling bad. So now hopefully we're getting the picture a little bit. So when we're simply seeking a feel-good experience after a feel-good experience for meditation, then it's going to limit us in, in contacting or uncovering that Buddha nature. So in the beginning, I think of, of one's Buddhist path, when once one's interested in going deeper through the methodologies of Buddhism uh, and Mayana Buddhism in particular, it's really good to study Buddha nature a little bit and reflect on it because this brings a lot of positivity in our life. So, you know, rather than this understanding that we're a screwed up person trying to become better, where then we're fighting and, you know, struggling, we recognize, oh, okay, something that I can't see right now necessarily, but there is completely okay and natural and sort of already awake in a way, you know, though, though again, that's, contentious that's debated in, in different schools of buddhism whether it's awake or whether it has to be cultivated like a seed to be cultivated but nonetheless the whole idea here is there's the, the potential is there and if the potential wasn't there then there wouldn't be any point to anything so in a way this is what brings meaningfulness and purpose because that buddha nature is also connected to the buddha nature of all beings it's an interconnected space it's not the same thing but it's also not different and so with that there's already a natural uh, uh interdependence interconnection you know we don't have to create that right but the the dualistic mind the mind that gets stuck in subject and object the mind that gets stuck in in feel good versus not feel good then needs to crave and cultivate relationships that feel good or push away relationships that don't feel good. And this is actually a lack of recognizing the innate nature that is already connected. So again, this is some kind of more advanced concepts, but nonetheless, this, when we talk about it and when we're kind of challenging ourselves to think about it differently like this, and maybe we have to do some more studying to kind of access some of these things. Nonetheless, it points our meditation in a different way. Even if we're a beginner, even if we don't understand half of what I'm saying, it's totally fine. Just hearing these things, just reflecting on them a little bit will point our meditation towards a, a, a more liberative practice as opposed to a limited practice. And again, what I'm defining as limited is simply seeking one feel good experience after another. Then we're just meditating out of craving and aversion. We're trying to block what doesn't feel good. We're trying to bring in what feels good. And we never contact what is innately good. So there's nothing wrong with you. If this, if this is resonating, you're like, damn, this has been, this has been happening. I, you, you, something resonates and you're hearing some struggles in your practice. And now maybe it's clicking why those struggles are happening. There's nothing wrong with you for that. Like this isn't an admonishment or I'm not pointing out like someone's a good meditator or a bad meditator. This happens to all of us. This is part of the overlay of our habitual confusion. And this is why we have the Dharma in scripture, in realization. This is why we have teachings and methodologies. So we can explore this as human beings together. This is the whole reason I'm saying it. I'm saying it because I'm still very much working on this, right? Um, and so I'm sure you are too. And so we could talk about it with each other. We can engage in a conversation uh, that's not about like whether something's better or worse. It's just, you know, uh, uh, what is going to work for, for certain outcomes and what are, what are going to work for other outcomes, right? So to me, it would be incredibly depressing if the Buddhist path was only about feeling good. Because that feeling good ends. It's sort of like, I've never, I don't know about you, I've never had an experience where something feels good and lasts, right? It, it, it changes. It's impermanent. Now, again, on the other side, I haven't had an experience where I feel bad or, 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 or um, uh, afflicted, and that lasts. That also changes. So there's good news, too. The afflictions, what feels 
uncomfortable also changes, but what feels comfortable changes. So if we're always trying to push out what's uncomfortable and we're always trying to bring in what's comfortable, it's very limited because it's changing. So we're trying to go uh, through meditation, through mindfulness in Buddhism, we're trying to go to underneath to the underlying nature, right? Uh, what we could say our, our Buddha nature. And there's many other ways to put this, just putting it this way today. So in a way, once we recognize this, like if this resonates, then we go through the process of cultivating this. And this is not an easy cultivation in the sense that like, there's still doubt, there's still confusion, but the path is to work through that confusion. So the path is not to be perfect, perfect. The path is not to know already. If we knew already, we wouldn't need a path. You wouldn't need a teacher. You wouldn't need a Dharma text. Uh, you wouldn't need any of that. We wouldn't need symbols of, of Dharma. Now, this is, some people might not like what I'm saying, but just think about it. Why do we have these things? We have these things. Wonder, you know, it's wonderful we have them. We still live in a world where representations of, of uh, awakening and compassion and bodhicitta still exist. I'm not demeaning that. What I'm saying is uh, uh, we need those. They're there to point us towards our nature, to point us towards our Buddha nature. And so if we use them uh, for that, if we engage them with that in an interconnected space of wanting to serve all beings through that, uh, our own liberation and awakening, wanting to serve others through our awakening, then this is what becomes authentically part of uh, uh, the Buddhist path, right? Now, again, it's also authentic uh, just to struggle and, and work with a basic mindfulness, right? The Buddha also, you know, started with some, some basic practices, but eventually uh, we, we mature in those practices and it has to upgrade, right? It has to go beyond a feel-good practice or, you know, feeling good or feeling bad from practice, going beyond that. So, like I was saying, um, this is a process. This isn't something that we're going to be necessarily good at right away. It's not going to be perfect. But once we, like, once it's clicked and once we realize, ah, okay, that's what I need to focus on, then we do the work of trying to understand how to do that. We do the work of engaging in, in a, in a in a more liberative mindfulness practice. And an, another way we, we start that as a beginner is intention. Intention is like, you could almost say like most, the majority of the Buddhist path is also intention, mindfulness and intention, where we're aiming the practice, where we're aiming the mind, where we're aiming uh, what we're using our life for. So the best intention from a Mayana perspective is Bodhicitta. Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you know, the founder of the FPMT, one of the founders, uh, one of my main founders, always says, live with bodhicitta, die with bodhicitta, meaning do every activity with this mind of bodhicitta. So when we're not in the meditation session, in the post-meditation, we reflect on bodhicitta. I'm walking for the benefit of all beings. I'm eating for the benefit of all beings. Through clearing this path, may I attain awakening for the benefit of all beings. Through minding my behavior, you know. You know, when I'm driving, being careful with others, may, may I attain awakening for the benefit of all beings. So engaging the mind in virtue with a purpose, right? Engaging the mind in virtue with this purpose that I want to attain awakening. Now, this might sound silly because it's just sort of like an affirmation, but it works because it trains the mind and it conditions us towards something that is eventually going to be unconditioned. <laughs> so again, a little bit of deep end Buddhism there, but nonetheless, like, you know, we can't just jump to the unconditioned, this final mindfulness I was talking about. You know, most of us need a, a progressive path where we have to use uh, um, positive conditions to ripen us going towards the unconditioned. So anyways, that's uh, all I really wanted to share today. I hope this was useful. Um, right now we can open it up to Q&A. I hope you've already been typing in your questions or you have your questions. Um, really, if like... Uh, um, kind of sad if people you know you don't want to engage i i get it if some people just don't have any questions but really just meaning sad in a sense like um we don't get to go deeper into this topic and i want to hear from you i want to hear um what you're struggling with and maybe what i said or what really sparked for you or um questions like i don't understand that and this is how we go deeper into the dharma together uh as a sangha uh so 
So even if you think it's kind of like a stupid question or you think you already know, just ask it anyways, right? It can give us something to dialogue and it also might really help others. So we can also think like that, even though maybe you know the answer, just throw it out there and then it'll help others. So um, Stephen, Lynn, I think we can yeah. do that now, yeah? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Scott. This this was really engaging and there was a lot to to touch upon. So as, as Scott said, we really do welcome your questions. Uh, you can put them in the comments section below in the Facebook feed. You can also send them privately to Sei Chen Ling's Facebook inbox and we'll share these with Scott. But um, we're just really gr- glad to have you back. Um, Scott, so we'll give everybody some time to maybe gather those questions. We have a few to start off with. And um, in the meantime, I'll let everybody know about some upcoming programs. As Lynn said, Taste of Buddhism is every Sunday at Sei Ling. We offer that for free on Facebook with a, a number of different teachers and facilitators um, to give the breadth um, of experience um, of the, the living experience of Buddhism and in particular Tibetan Buddhism. So we really hope you come back to, to us each Sunday for that. Next week, we have Venerable Amy Miller. And the week after that, we have Venerable Gilton Lechten. Um, so we're really glad to have this engaging program. Uh, coming up this week, we also have a, another major live stream with um, Professor James Apple, one of the world's um, leading um, experts in the field of study of the thought and life of uh, Atisha Dibankara, a lama from India who left an indelible and pervasive um, uh, influence on Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so on Friday, August 28th, he'll be doing a live stream talking about the life and thought of Atisha and the contributions he made. We have a number of upcoming uh, live streams and programs as well. We have online retreats, uh, one in particular on Green Tara with Venable Rabina Corton coming up. Um, and then in September, we have on September 19th, Vicki McKenzie, a noted author talking about the revolutionary lives of two amazing Buddhist nuns, uh, Frida Betty and Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. So please check out seichenling.org for all of our information about programs. And also um, check out our Facebook um, and LinkedIn. We have a number of uh, social media channels where you can find out information. There's a YouTube channel as well where a number of these uh, video offerings are archived. So Scott, to get us started, um, we'll talk about uh, a couple of things that you touched upon. And, and maybe if we could just take a moment, you talked early on about dropping into the body and that, that people can kind of use that in particular, you know, particular times and um, as they're beginning their meditation practice. Could you just expand upon that dropping into your body and what that, what that means? Sure. Um, so typically, I, I think we didn't have to distinguish this so much in, in heritage Buddhist cultures, though I'm not from a heritage Buddhist culture, obviously. <laughs> and, um, you know, even now, heritage Buddhist cultures in, in, in Asian countries are, are changing and modernizing. But typically, like in a pre-modern heritage Buddhist culture, um, from what I've heard from, from my, uh, uh, from heritage Buddhists that I study with as well as friends is that there, there was already this link between body and mind. That, that link wasn't broken. It was sort of there. So when the, when the, when the Lama or teacher or someone read a sutra or the Buddha says, you know, sit and be mindful, it's not a mindfulness that's cut off from the body. Now, uh, the, one of the theories out there is that, um, modernization, one elements uh, that has been uh, a little bit, um, uh, uh, unhealthy from it is that it's it's slowly separated some of us from our bodies and not all of us obviously this, is a, this can be an individual thing but what this means is sort of a tendency to be more in the thinking mind and analytical conceptual reasoning mind versus the feeling world now there are benefits to being in the reasoning mind right um there are modern benefits and and sort of amazing technologies we've, we've been able to create with, with the reasoning mind and the logical mind. But when we preference that, um, sometimes for us and the way we're schooled and the way we're trained and the way we're raised, we get separated from the feeling world of the body, meaning uh, sensations, emotions, moods. Um, I'm not saying we don't experience those. It just means we don't have a way to work with those in a healthy way. And 
it's sort of like a program running in the background where, you know, we feel a little constriction in the body or tension or stress. We might uh, also feel sort of a certain mood or emotion, but it, it, we're mainly thinking about that. We don't have a way to relate to that directly. And so one remedy for that is um, to simply um, highlight or center the body a little bit more in our meditation. So something I've been doing for 10 years, uh, uh, the last 10 years in my practice, I would say the first 10 years were not completely without body in my practice, but I think I, I wasn't aware. So there's a lot of disembodiment happening, which can create more stress in meditation. So Instead, dropping into the body just means feeling the body. And I think, you know, the Buddha taught this within the first foundation of awareness. Uh, so, so awareness or mindfulness of body and breath. And that can become a way to reconnect to the body. Just simply being in the body, aware of body, mindful of body, and feeling. And so over time, as we do that more and more, we, we, we reconnect those uh, uh synapses right now uh, we reconnect those those lines and then slowly we can feel more at ease in the body more relaxed part of some of the uh, anxiety and stress that's happening in modern society is this disconnect but of course it's also speediness and sort of uh you know a lot of us kind of go 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 do 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 there's a lot of pressures on us externally and so it's it's hard for us to just be and even when we do want to just be, we can't. The thinking mind is running, running, running. So it's not about pushing out the thinking mind. It's just about, about giving a little bit more time towards feeling our experience in the body. And then over time, things will reconnect. Wonderful. Along those lines, you know, um, one thing in society that we're taught, we're taught from a very early age is to kind of be hyper vigilant. And with that, we're always trying to problem solve. You know, when we get sick, we jump on WebMD, we're immediately jumping into, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. Is there a time in meditation when you are, when being hyper vigilant in this way and hyper problem solving focused is the right method? And is there a time to actually not do that? Um, I know certainly, you know, in the case of a diagnosis with, um, you know, if I have a runny nose, running to M WebMD may lead you into a, um, an agitated state. So when and how do you use this energy um, in emerging meditation practice? Yeah, this is a, a really challenging one. Because we need to attend to relative truth, right? And relative truth means uh, just what's arising on a relative level, right? Like what, what appears to us, what we see, what we're interacting with. But when that relative truth becomes more distorted, then sometimes we have this sense that we have to attend to something that actually doesn't need our attention or we're giving it over attention. So I think the first step is, is reconnecting to the body, taking some time to do that. And that doesn't, you know, that can mean different things for each of us. Uh, it's not a technique. It's not a quick fix uh, uh, um, instrumentalized meditation. It's just something we do and we engage with. And if we need help from others, we can seek out, you know, uh, people to help us with that, that and, and to engage with that. But nonetheless, that, that reconnection, once that starts to happen, then we're able to uh, basically, um, what's the word, uh, distinguish between the distorted relative and the authentic relative a little bit more. So distorted relative is sort of... Uh, one of my teachers says it's like it's like uh, seeing a bear where there's a cow, <laughs> right? And so, like Stephen had a good example there, you know, like uh, sure, a runny nose could be leading to a cold or flu, and we want to know what to do, and you know, that's no problem. That's a cow, right? It's I mean, just imagine a cow in a field. I mean, I'm using that as an analogy where it's like, yeah, there's a there's a thing arising. It's not nothing, you know, cold or flu is something we want to remedy. But yet, if, if, if it became this, this, if it became distorted through the, the body uh, being agitated and extra stressed and nervous and that being accumulated over many years, it, the, that flu, that cold, which is you know, normal and natural to the body, becomes a bear, right? In the sense, like a threat. That's the key word here. A cow, generally for most of us, is probably not so much of a threat. Maybe if you're like, you know, Underneath it, it's a little bit of a threat if it steps on you, but you know, we're talking at a distance. Where if you see a bear at a distance, it's a threat, right? There's, you know, I gotta be careful here, right? This could get tricky and hairy and life threatening. 
So I think that's how so we begin to distinguish relative, authentic relative from distorted. Distorted would be there's no bear, but we think there's a bear, right? So again, we can see this with um, one framing for this in Western psychology is trauma. Like where traumas, uh, uh, the habitual pattern is telling us something, uh, is giving us the impression that there's something more to the situation that there is and that the situation is a threat when it's not. That's not all trauma, but that's one way to describe some traumas. And so in a way, um, you know, we could kind of say we all have this kind of a lot of us in modern culture have this reaction to things where we overestimate what they are. So again, we can see this very clearly in the pandemic. Some people are overreacting. Some people are underreacting. Both are not really relating to the relative in an authentic way, which is there is something happening. There is a coronavirus, uh, most likely. <laughs> I have friends who wanted the baby on that. I think there is. There's some physical thing happening, right? And so we need to take care. There's certain actions we can take. And we don't know ultimately what to do. It's a, it's a new disease to, to man, to, to women, to humans. Um, and so we don't know exactly what to do, but we're trying. And, and so I think it's the, the relative authentic is you know doing what we know is going to help with this, but then being careful not to go into these extremes because that's coming from the distortion. But we each have to recognize our own distortion. One of the distortions is when we feel the need to scream at others and rage on others of what their distortion is. That's a little bit, hmm, I'm not sure if that's going to work as a, as a relational technique or a social technique or a communal technique. You know, uh, I think where I tend to focus is, is we, we need the tools to, to work with uh, what's arising and then to treat that as a process. So the last thing I wanted to say around this is, instrumentalized meditation is wonderful as a first step to get in the door of mindfulness and awareness and, and these practices. But it can, if we keep going with instrumentalized meditation, it can kind of turn into this inauthentic relative in the sense, or, or this sort of relative that's distorted, right? Uh, where, where we're always trying to pro fix the problem. And we're trying to use a relative means to ultimately fix a relative problem. Does that make sense? So it's like the relative can't function as an ultimate. It's just a relative thing that changes and, you know, modifies and can temporarily uh, change the circumstance of something, but won't ultimately change it. So another way one of my llamas says this is it's sort of like um, uh, uh, if, if we're stuck in a problem solution paradigm, the solution is going to always lead to another problem. So eventually we have to look and be skillful of, of, of well, is there something outside of this problem solution paradigm? And, and um, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, uh, some of us feel the Buddha did discover that, that there is some uh, methodologies and path and process towards going beyond the problem and solution. That's what I was talking about uh, related to our Buddha nature. Wonderful, Scott. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Along those lines, we have a question from Facebook. What is a good, specific, simple way to move from a secular mindfulness practice into a deeper practice? What would you recommend? Yeah. There's a lot of different ways. So I don't want to kind of like be too particular because it's it can be personal how we move. And it can be personal depending on like what our proclivities are and what uh, basically I would say like I usually ask people. <laughs> I used to ask mentees like who I work with, like students I work with privately. I used to say, so on a scale from one to 10, what's your allergy towards religion? And it was sort of a joke, but it would kind of give me also a view of, of what I'm working with, uh, with someone. So um, typically what I would say to someone who doesn't have a strong allergy, though I would say kind of like maybe because a lot of religion has been misused in the modern world. We all have, you know, many of us who come to Buddhism as a, a as a sort of we're, we're curious in it or we want to convert to it. We come usually with some sort of resistance or rejection of some other kind of religion or spiritual idea. And this we do. I, I you know, I'm just as an invitation. I think eventually we we, we will need to work with that um, uh, trauma, like that sense of, you know, uh, rejection coming from you know, a little bit of a wound. So it doesn't mean like we're bad because of that wound or it's our fault. It just means it's something to work with. But, you know, just giving that as a, a preamble. But more, mostly what I would recommend to people is um, um, find teachers who are, who are qualified in, in the tradition they teach in that who have put in the time in a heritage Buddhist tradition. 
and and I I, I tend to center um, not the 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 sort of westernized forms of of Buddhism, though those can be really helpful as sort of a an entrance and some people just want to do that and that's fine. Um, but I, I still think there's a lot of value to be had in, in really trying to connect with a heritage Buddhist tradition in, in how it is and, and leaving our mind open that, Hey, I might not be able to relate to all of this right away. I might not be able to understand everything they're saying. And I might even have some resistance to some of the rituals and cultural things that arise in that heritage Buddhist tradition. But nonetheless, I want to engage something, um, from sort of its source and and i that's the route i went and i and i do think it has value if we stick in with that um and then i would say second to that and sort of concurrent with it is is learning so in mayana buddhism we we basically engage these three ri- wisdoms we call the wisdom of of learning or study the wisdom of reflection and the wisdom of meditation so these three wisdoms are taken as a unit uh, they're wisdoms that we grow as a process. And um, for most of us, they start these days. It starts with meditation, but that's actually the reverse um, for, mo- for most Himalayan Buddhist traditions, though some Buddhist traditions do start with that. They just say, just sit. They don't give you a lot of reading. So I, I don't want to say there's like a right way. Uh, some traditions, it's valid. They do do that. Um, like Zen Buddhism, some Zen traditions can do that. And that's valid because they have a system than where you go with that right but typically in himalayan buddhism we we start with learning we start with study so we get an idea of the structure we're working with and the mind can can kind of uh, uh inquire into some principles and and basics of the dharma that when we engage the practice the practice has more meaning so i distinguish this this isn't really about believing in something or having faith in something it's about informing ourselves with the with a view that then informs the meditation. But when we're informing with the view, we're also doing some checking and skepticism and inquiry. And um, that has to be a part of the study as well. And, and that's more comes in the reflection period. We're reflecting on what we've learned in order to gain more certainty in what we access through study or learning through a teacher or a Dharma book or whatever, or a course. And then once we have a little more certainty through the reflection, yeah, I think this makes sense. Like, yeah, impermanence seems, you know, accurate. That's just a conceptual um, uh, certainty. Then we have to put it into meditation to experience that directly, right? So I would say um, uh, those are a few good ways. So I, I always recommend, you know, look for a teacher. Look for, you know, either either a, a teacher that can bridge in, help help you bridge into heritage Buddhist traditions, or if you're ready, just, you know, jump into the heritage Buddhist stuff, but, you know, be also, uh, it's okay to take it slow. Like, um, mm, sometimes we, we, we have kind of bak chuck, uh, which are like habitual patterns coming from this life or, or past lives that, that kind of come in and we get really inspired by the Dharma or a certain lineage or teacher. And that's great, but don't just rely on that. We have to do some investigation and, 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 and sort of going slow. One of my teachers says, uh, don't be like burning plastic. It's plastic. If you light it on fire, it just goes whoop, and then it's gone. And, you know, so going slow is a little more safe in the sense of like, what that means is, is there's no rush to become a believer right away. Um, uh, there's a there's a famous quote by Nagarjuna where it says like believers in in uh, shunyata are, are incorrigible. So there's kind of there's this sense that like you know we could apply this uh, to a lot of different things, which is like uh, belief might be a, a great way to to sort of augment beliefs that were harming us. So we we kind of upgrade our beliefs into something that's more beneficial. But ultimately, we have to do the work of of kind of searching and looking and and clarifying for ourselves, either conceptually or through practice, or or we really trust someone. Like that's where teachers can be helpful when we've done enough investigation into the teacher and seen, yeah, this person seems solid. Like they seem like they walk their talk. They have compassion. They have knowledge. They're connected to. Uh, 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 a heritage Buddhist lineage, something something like that has history and repetition, and you know it's verifiable through many different practitioners. The the experience that we get, and um, and and so when we connect with that person, and we and we feel, yeah, this is I like this this person. Then we can also follow what they say to a certain degree because we we've investigated them. So that's another way to do it. 
So it's kind of like all of the above uh, study, connecting to teachers and just, you know, going slow with a good heart, all of that. Wonderful, Scott. We have a, a, a few different questions. We actually may go over time. If, if you do, if you have a few minutes beyond our, our normal stop time, that way we can get all of our questions in. I probably have like uh, five minutes over. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, we've got, I'm going to stay on questions related to meditation. And then we have uh, a question related to Buddha nature. So I'll come back to that. Um, one question says, you mentioned people asking, is this it after meditating a bit? Um, I noticed that a lot during meditation sitting, um, that feeling, uh, this person notices that. Could you talk about um, how to note that during a sitting, uh, how to note that experience during sitting and to let go of trying to define, is this it? Did I get it during an actual meditation practice? And could so could you define that and describe a method how to note that? And also, could you address, is it just the craving mind, the self-grasping eye, to attach to the experience that that leads to this yeah so so normally what we have is a uh, kind of three modes of how we're we're engaging and recognizing progress on the buddhist path uh, we have understanding um which is conceptual right this comes from study and reflection and meditation to a certain degree then we have experience which comes and goes it's like it's like being patchy like patchwork right where we get a little taste oh wow you know Maybe that's bodhicitta, maybe that's, you know, shunyata, whatever. We get a little taste. And then, and then the, the third aspect is unchanging realization. When we've moved beyond mere understanding, we've moved beyond mere like patchwork of experience into that being a stabilized uh, 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 either, either way of being or, or realization or experience. So it's more stable. So that's kind of the process, this, you know, moving from understanding to experience to, to realization or unchanging experience, maybe is another way to say it. Uh, so, but as far as it goes, when we're working with a certain practice, I in particular, and again, different teachers might say this different ways. So it's just my sort of opinion and sort of how some of my lamas uh, <laughs> have reiterated it to me. When you're in the meditation period, don't worry so much. This is where it gets really wonky is if we're in the meditation and engaging a process of, let's say, analytical meditation or shamatha or vipassana, and we're constantly checking if you're doing it right. Um, there Now, again, each of these has their own way of making sure you're maintaining the meditation, right? That I'm not, that you have to do. So shamatha has its own ways of maintaining shamatha. The, let's just put that aside. That's just part of the practice of shamatha. Vipassana has its own ways of maintaining Vipassana, depending on the, the level of Vipassana we're doing or what method we're applying. So that, that's, that's just a given. We have to apply that. But now this extra layer where we might be wondering, uh, oh, you know, am I doing it right? Is this it? You know, oh, we had a little experience. So we're like, that's it. That, I think, don't worry. Just Just don't let that... Let the experience come. Let it go. Don't try to analyze your 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 experience so much within the practice. Just engage the process of what you're working with, whether you're training in in bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta, lojong, shamatha, whatever, whatever you're training in. Just engage the practice. Now, post meditation, depending on the meditation uh, we're doing, we can see the result. We can see sort of how the mind is, right? So, of course, shamatha, for instance, has like nine stages of calm abiding in the, in the sutra on a vehicle. Um, and so we can check how is the mind abiding. And we can see, and that's fine, you know, but, you know, I don't think it's that healthy to check all the time because that's a little bit like you mentioned craving. I think we have to look there too. Like, what are we, you know, we have to be able to relax into the practice and just kind of show up and continue to, to grow the capacity over time. I like uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's sense of this when it comes to uh, bodhicitta, which he says, you know, or when it comes to awakening, he says, no matter if it happens this life or in, you know, 100,000 lives, I'm just in this. I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing now, but he kind of was kind of saying like that. I'm just, I'm just doing this. And so it's okay. So we kind of like, we have vigilance, but we also can kind of relax into that. And so, um, in a way, there's there's uh, supposedly bodhisattvas who who 
make a pledge not to attain awakening and kind of stay at the, the, the ninth Bumi or 10th Bumi right before awakening and uh, or between the eighth and the 10th Bumi's uh, levels be before Buddhahood, you know, and actually the, the kind of the irony here is they, they, they pledge that with a lot of compassion because they want to kind of remain in a certain way to benefit beings. And, and yet they attain awakening the quickest, <laughs> you know, cause they kind of let, like let go of this per this ego identity that is going to awaken. So there is some benefit to that, but nonetheless, it is good to like, see, am I becoming more compassionate? Am I becoming uh, 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 more free uh, with, with, with how I'm relating to emotions and thoughts? Am I still fixed by them or caught or am I caught up in them and you know tossed around by them so that is good to check uh but don't check too often just you know and I don't have a you know formula for that you just have to see wonderful Scott uh along those lines in terms of of staying on the meditation cushion we have a question um the person writes I have trouble being able to stay with what's arising without following the thoughts or just moving from the feelings, thoughts themselves. Can you talk a bit more on that? Yeah. The practice I found really helpful for this is just doing the practice we started with. Don't try to, don't try to control the experience. Don't even try to meditate necessarily. Just be aware of the body and feel the body and then allow. So that means like if something comfortable is there great. If something uncomfortable is there, we, we, we try to sit with that with compassion, right? We're not indulging in it. We're not just gritting our teeth through it. We're, we're, we're allowing. So there's this element of, of developing this sense of being with what's arising in the body and ourself. And that usually really helps because, um, you know, often we're trying to, to control the meditation through the thinking mind when actually it's, it's the body that's unsettled and the body needs to settle. So, in a way, it's like uh, um, when we define shamatha, for instance, in one translation is calm abiding. So the result, the goal is not calmness, but we need calmness and relaxation to, to, to be a container to sustain mindful awareness. And if everything's all agitated, then it just becomes that much more difficult. Uh, so for me personally, like, like uh, what's the word? Trying to wrestle the, 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 agitation into submission didn't work it just created more agitation so for me i had to learn to relax and i'm, I'm still doing that right i don't definitely don't have like shamatha stabilization still working on it but uh that really helped me and and so i think just going to the body learning to relax um, but with awareness will help wonderful scott and lastly um uh the questioner writes how do you cultivate your buddha nature during meditation and that's how it's asked so um either how to cultivate or maybe talk a bit how combining awareness um uh of buddha nature on in a meditation session this one's easy you just practice the buddhist path learn it train in it uh meet good teachers like i said who you can trust who you know are connected to a lineage and, and again some people misunderstand me sometimes when i say authenticity or lineage they might think i'm like uh, preferencing something or trying to say like snooty, like this is authentic, this is inauthentic. No, what I mean by authentic is that someone who's, who's trained, who's trained in a tradition that has had verifiable, verifiable realiz subjective realization over hundreds and thousands of years. I trust that a lot more than just someone who's like trying something new and like, Oh, I have this new amazing way of using mindfulness. And I'm not saying they're bad or that that can't work, but when, when something's verifiable through a lineage, when their teacher gained realization and their teacher gained realization, I trust this more. Right. And this has nothing to do with like belief or faith. It's, it's, it's verifiable. Right. So in Buddhism, we kind of have subjective, uh, you know, we, we, we accept a subjective, verification and this should show through the person's actions and who they are and how they express themselves uh, uh it, it's going to be someone who who can can enact bodhisattva activity uh in, in, in a in a in a less fixated way so we can see it in their actions even though we can't see their mind but anyways um so yeah that's what i'm saying so so training in the buddhist path that's what it's meant to do you know like churning the milk the butter 
will arise, right? So we churn the milk. We, you know, another example uh, is, you know, we have the, the, the gold mix in with the uh, rock and other substances. And so we, we engage a process to, to remove the dross from the gold, gold being our Buddha nature. So we have to do something. And so basically, shamatha, vipassana, relative bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta, uh, uh, the, the, the vehicles, of the yanas of hinayana, mayana, vajrayana, this is the synthesis we form in, in Himalayan Buddhism. All of that will uncover or, or, or sort of grow our, our Buddha nature, you know, will connect us to the potential of our Buddha nature. So, you know, we don't have to worry so much. You just engage the path and naturally it will come. I think that's what's so beautiful when we engage uh, the Buddhist path is um, we don't have to like build something that we're not. We're just, you know, naturally, it, I would say, okay, this isn't me saying this. This is actually one of my lamas. He said, if some part of the path is not doing that, we can kind of take it out, right? So he said, what's authentically Buddha Dharma should do that. Now, again, it's not saying, he's not also saying it maybe will do that for you because maybe you have an obstacle you have to work with or you're, you're stuck in a bias and not able to work with it. But if we're practicing authentically and we're training and, uh, and the method is authentic, it will definitely reveal our Buddha nature if we, if we keep going and we have the right components and the right conditions and, and you know, all of that. And yeah, so we don't have to worry so much. Just keep going.